for once again, welcome. Um, if you're, this is your first time at the Black New England Conference, we hope this won't be your last, and we sure this won't be your last. Um, for our returning attendees, thank you again for your continued support. Nothing can replace an in-person conference, and we look forward to being in person with you all in the future. Um, but thank you again to Southern New Hampshire University for their expertise and all of their tech support, who, which has allowed us to gather in this format. I um, mean, thank you, Jerry Ann Bogus and the Black Heritage Trail staff for all the work that they have done um, to produce this conference and really provide us with strength and tools of resistance for all the work we have ahead. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sherry Robinson, who will get us started with our first present, uh, panel presentation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Brinson. I am so, so excited um, to open up our, our morning panelists. Um, I just want to reiterate what Dennis and Jada said. If you, yesterday was such a treat, and it was just such um, affirming and validating as a Black woman that rocks <laughs> um, to hear from iconic um, Susan Taylor. I, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I have not picked up an Essence magazine in a minute, and it just, but it reminded me as a young girl, as a teenager, as a young woman in my 20s and 30s, how important Essence magazine was to our, to us as Black women, um, and Susan Taylor as a spiritual inspirational voice. So, uh, what it was, it was just so. I went to bed feeling so nourished. So thank you all so much, um, the Black New, New England Heritage Trail, for bringing such a phenomenal, iconic speaker uh, that just spoke to our hearts last night. So without further ado, I am super, super excited to introduce um, this panelist um, of phenomenal, phenomenal, inspirational um, Black women that are on point. Um, but I probably should introduce myself, right? So I am Dr. Shari Robinson, and um, I know the bio says that I'm the director of PAC, but as of a week ago, I've been promoted to um, dean of students at the University of New Hampshire. So um, really excited, a little nervous about what all that means, <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I feel highly blessed and, and favored um, to have an opportunity to engage our students at University of New Hampshire in this regard. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have three panelists, um, and I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to present. Um, each panelist will have 10 minutes or so, and I think, you know, we're starting on time, and we have a little wiggle room, and so I will serve as kind of the time check or timekeeper, and so to our panelists, you know, I'll put in the chat room, you have two minutes you know, you're at your two minute warning. Um, let's see, so let me, you know, with technology, you got, I have multiple screens going on right now. So let me get to the screen. Okay. So our first panelist um, is Kashaw Thompson. She is proud, she's a proud third generation native of Washington, D.C. She is an early child care development expert working as a Head Start teacher at Bright Beginnings, in addition to being a trained doula. Kashaw is a well-known social media influencer in DC and across the country. She is a writer who first got her start about beauty and lifestyle topics on her award-winning blog, Little Dirty Pretty Things. Kashaw is also a Black cultural pioneer creating the concept of Black Girls Are Magic, which sprung for her life as a little girl growing up with her mother, grandmother, and aunt. Black Girls Are Magic became wildly popular in 2013 after Kashaw began using the phrase online, which was later shortened to the hashtag Black Girl Magic, to uplift and praise the accomplishments, beauties, and, uh, and other amazing qualities of Black women. Our next panelist is Dorothy Clark, is a journalist and historian and editor of Historic New England Magazine, an independent researcher and adjunct history instructor at Boston Architectural 
Architecture College, where she is a member of the Presidential Advisory Council for Social Justice. She is a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society and a member of the Board of Directors of the Lauren Green Greenow House in Jamaica Plain, Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, and Girls Rock Campaign in Boston. Ms. Clark holds a Master of Arts degree in Historic Preservation and American History and a Bachelor's degree in Journalism. Our last panelist is Dr. Karen McLean, I'm sorry, McLean Dade, is a full professor in secondary education at Western Washington University in the field of creative intelligence and multicultural education. Her doctorate dissertation from the University of Massachusetts and subsequent related book publications and journal articles focus on combating racism through the eyes of students. She is recognized as a leading scholar. She is recognized as a leading scholar in multicultural education and has held significant positions in academic professional associations. She is the founder, director of Multicultural International, International Development Company that focuses on consulting in areas of equity and diversity, social justice, and art education, and women of color empowerment. To date, she has traveled, worked, and presented in over 40 countries. She is available for cross-culture and women empowerment education consultations, speaking engagements, and curriculum development. So without further ado, um, I would like to have Kashaw Thompson take over. Um, thank you for having me with your conference. Um, I was very surprised but elated to be invited because I, you know, I never like expect things like this to happen for me, but it's pretty great when it does. Um, when I sent in my uh, title for my talk, I told I said that my title was Black Girl Magic, where everything from EBT to PhD. And um, the point of that for me is that since the hashtag Black Girl Magic had gotten so popular, like in popular culture, we see it and hear it online all the time, of course, but in TV shows and movies and all those kinds of things that there had become a level of stratification for black women and respect about respectability politics involved with what black girl magic is so i've had to write about it i've had to speak about it but i just wanted to always emphasize that black girl magic came from the hood so there's no space to um exclude women who we think aren't accomplished enough who think don't meet certain criteria to be included in a movement that I, you know, kicked off based on the women in my family. So Black Girl Magic has all of its roots in the hood, so we can't leave out hood girls. But we also can't leave out Black women whose journey to womanhood doesn't look just like ours. So that means Black women in the LGBT community, that means Black women who live with disabilities, that Black means black women and girls who live who are experiencing homelessness or poverty or other um traumas like that all of us we are nothing without all of us and so i talk to people i use my online presence to always emphasize that black girls are magic is no it's not a thing that you have it's a thing that you are so what to me what happened what made things bad they got shortened now, i understand technically why it was shortened it was shortened because when we started using black girl hashtag black girls on magic twitter had a very uh shorter you know capacity for messaging so it was it was truncated for that reason but in the process it became a thing to commodify it became a thing to have instead of our innate state of being. I always say words mean something and the, drop, and the verb was dropped. You know, it, the verb was dropped. It's a thing that we are, not a thing that we have. And 
a few weeks ago, maybe last month sometime, when the professor at GW, you know, was exposed and admitted to, you know, kind of close playing black womanhood, I kind of connected it to the commodification of black girls are magic because once you turn a thing in something to something you can have, it's a mad scramble to have it, especially if it looks like, you know, something good, it feels good, it looks good, it sounds good, that kind of thing. People want to take it and put it on. You know, it was like she just put on the divinity of black womanhood as a cloak, you know, and what she didn't what she didn't consider was that that cloak was hand stitched into my blood and bones by my ancestral mothers, by my mother, by my grandmother, by my great grandmother. You don't just get to put that on. You know, you don't just get to walk around in that and discard it when it no longer serves you because even if that were the case, I would never take mine off. And <clears throat> it to me, it was like inextricably linked to the commodification of black girl magic and all of black culture, especially black girl culture. The things we do, we do as cultural architect architects is always something that people find so special that they want to have. And we are not a thing that you can have. We are, period. You know, we just are. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to talk about how we, in every form that we show up, our magic and how that magic is not for everybody. You can't just put it on, you can't just be it because you feel like being it on any given day. Because you know, you want our rhythm but not our blues and that to me that's never been cool. And I don't know if I used all my time, I felt like I talked a lot, but I definitely want to answer any questions that people may have around it because there have been so many questions about, you know, well, that phrase was used before. How do you feel like you, you know, it was a thing that you coined or why not black white girl magic or uh, what are other questions I've gotten? The, mo the thing that hurt me the most was when black girls who were like me, black women who, you know, had had babies early like I did, who had worked these, what we now know to be essential positions in society. Um, black girls who were undereducated or uneducated, um, that didn't have a husband or didn't have line sisters or didn't have that degree that is so coveted. How so many black women had sent me messages saying they felt left out. Like that, that hurt me because how can you feel left out when I, when we are the same people? And when I said it, I didn't say it because I had seen Michelle Obama on TV. Michelle Obama was probably in college or high school when I first thought it up. So <clears throat> never, that was never my inspiration. My inspiration is my mother who got her degree at 40 after raising children she birthed in her teen years. My inspiration was my grandmother who raised 10 children with a ninth grade education who always wanted to be a music teacher, but ended up working at Washington Hospital Center and housekeeping for 35 years um, after she left the South. My inspiration, my aunts who, my aunt who does, who did hair and did my hair and makeup for prom when I was 17. And my sister who does hair, you know, downtown, she works in a corporate salon and at home she's doing braids and weaves and stuff like what I'm wearing right now. So those are my inspirations, not Mrs. Obama, as much as I respect and love her. You know, so I never liked the idea that they were, there were women who looked like me, who have lived and moved through society like me, who felt left out of black girl magic. And the, the authenticity of what it is, is what lends itself to the creativity I've been able to, you know, harness around it. So again, I always say, who are we without all of us? We can't, we can't leave anybody out. We just can't. 
So, Kashaw, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate, I mean, this was heartfelt. Like, you were just speaking from your heart and your lived experiences. And you did not use all your 10 minutes, but that's cool, right? That's okay. Cool. That just, yeah, that means we just have more time on the back end of all of this. Um, and we will save questions for last. So one of the things I did not say in the opening, but Kashaw, you, you reminded me, and thank you very much, is please, if you have questions, I would ask that you put them in your chat. You put them in the chat. And if you can like, you know, title questions, and then, you know, then insert your question, and that will jump out at me really easily and readily as I'm multitasking um, this morning. Um, so we'll hear from, the, from our all three panelists, and then we'll fill questions. And really, when I say fill questions, I just really want to engage us and facilitate what I think is going to be a rich, um, provocative discussion this morning, and not just, you know, just a kind of Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Ms. Dorothy Clark to take it over. Good morning, everyone. I am going to share my screen here and talk with you. When the protest erupted across the United States and around the world after police in Minneapolis killed George Floyd on Memorial Day, the voice of Sister Soldier came rapping back to me, telling me that in the 28 years since she released her only album, 360 Degrees of Power, little, if anything, had changed about the nation's policing of Black people. And then in rapid fire succession, several more Black Americans had died or were injured, and we learned that there were others before George Floyd. The result of Ms. Dorothy. Yes. Ms. I'm so sorry. Uh-huh. We're not seeing the your the screen. I, I think Oh wait, wait. You know, okay. Okay. okay, hold I on. Make your call. Okay. I see what I need I'm to so do. So sorry. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So if you maybe want to, why don't you go ahead and start over? Because we were just not seeing the screen while you okay. were talking. Okay. Okay. It's kind of like just a background anyway. <laughs> okay. So when the protest uh, erupted throughout the United States and around the world after police in Minneapolis killed George Floyd on Memorial Day, the voice of Sister Soldier came rapping back to me telling me that in the 28 years since she had released her only album, 360 Degrees of Power, little, if anything, had changed about the nation's thing of Black people. And then in rapid fire succession, several more Black Americans had died or were injured, and we learned that there were others before George Floyd, the result of wanton violence by police or other empowered whites exercising their entitlement to kill people of color. As if foreseeing the founding of Black Lives Matter, Sister Soldier observed during a press conference nearly three decades ago. Is it that white death means so much more than black death and there is an absolute double standard? Interestingly, Sister Soldier's name has been in the news recently but not because of any lesson she's tried to impart. It's an election year, prop. Her name is stripped from her personhood and her activism and reduced to the political term, a sister soldier moment. A Washington Post opinion piece opined that Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden needed a sister soldier moment as an act of independence to distance himself enough so, that, so as not to appear to sanction the agitation going on in the country for social justice. Another opinion writer, this one at the New York Times, who also serves as a CBS News political analyst, said the occupant of the White House, you know who that is, needs a sister soldier moment by rebuking the white supremacist domestic terrorist whom he attracts. It seems that opinion experts with media platforms 
readily commodify Sister Soldier as a political tool to advance the aspirations of white male politicians while negating her frontline presence as a change agent. The term even has a Wikipedia page. And it's defined there as a politician's public repudiation of an extremist person or group, statement or position perceived to have some association with the politician or the politician's party. Now, this so-called sister soldier moment isn't really what I had wanted to talk about when I uh, submitted my proposal to speak at this conference, but I think it calls for rebutting. The term typically comes up during an election year, having been coined in 1992, when presidential hopeful Bill Clinton decided to use a comment taken out of context that Sister Soldier had made about racial violence. Clinton explained at the time, what she said really bothered me, not only because she said it, but because she is somebody who is obviously bright and has a lot of influence over young people. In my opinion, that was a sly way of not actually labeling her articulate. It was also an expression of his fear about Sister Soldier's impact on young black people. Contemporary history, as chronicled by the news media, persist in disseminating Sister Soldier's misinterpreted comment. It is much more newsworthy to disregard her legacy of activism and depict her as an angry black woman. Yes, I am angry, Sister Soldier once told an interviewer, which means I am sane. My album creates pressure on white America, a lot of pressure. And pressure is what white America needs, deserves, and inherited. Sister Soldier was more than a moment then, and she's more than a recollection now. But the pantheon of female hip hop creators doesn't include her. And that says something about who compiles such list. She's not there as an activist, a rapper, nor a best-selling novelist, when in fact, since her late teen years in the late 1970s and early 1980s, she has been working for the educational, economic, and cultural emancipation of African and African-descended people from the shackles of white supremacy. 360 Degrees of Power is Sister Soldier's fervent critique of the Black experience in America. In the part Jeremiah, part dedication opening of this collection of 13 rap and spoken word offerings, she states, most people won't accept my activism and this album until after I'm dead and the blood's all over the ground. It has been 28 years since 360 Degrees of Power was released and the blood of so many Black Americans continues to be spilt all over America's ground. Listening back, the uncompromising and unaccommodating words Sister Soldier delivered on 360 Degrees of Power are present right here. And yet what she was saying in those earlier years was not a new critical analysis of white supremacy and systemic racism. A key difference today is that with there are more allies and co-conspirators joining the struggle. The call for the eradication of racism is louder and more varied, and the timbre is different. So how will the voices such as Sister Soldiers, as well as those of our foremothers, be amplified and given a forum along with the rightful credit for their efforts and contributions in the spheres of change in which they operated. Black women have been responsible for so much, both out of necessity and the multidimensional natures of womanhood that we have defined for ourselves. Sister Soldier once explained to an audience, as an African woman, she said, 
I have to have the intellectual capacity. I have to have the emotional depth. I have to have the psychological sturdiness to be able to distinguish between that which this society gives me and that which I need as an African woman. I am an African woman, and as an African woman, I possess 360 degrees of power. Black women are the embodiment of 360 degrees of power. We are the very definition of dynamic, the noun, a force or factor that controls or influences a process of growth, change, interaction, or activity, as well as the adjective, marked by usually continuous and productive activity or change. 360 degrees of power is the multidimensionality of our very being and presence, the sum of our human geographic effect. The album 360 Degrees of Power garnered more criticism than critical acclaim. It wasn't a hit, spending 13 weeks on the chart and peaking at number 72 on the top R&B hip hop album chart. It only sold 27,000 copies. And probably now, since I bought it again recently, 27,001 copies. The singles and the music videos that came from the album, The Hate That Hate Produced, and The Final Solution, Slavery's Back in Effect, were banned by MTV, which cited them for inflammatory language and imagery. The only thing Sister Soldier's detractors heard was her excoriation of systemic racism and white supremacy. Was there any reason that she should have gone easy on those who, as she says, built this wicked system? She calls it that in the song, The Hate That Hate Produced. And that song seems to predict today's white fragility movement. But Sister Soldier didn't devote the full 360 degrees to targeting whites. She called out her own people too, and with a strident urgency that was too extreme for some of us. On the track, African scaredy cats in a one exit maze, she raps. African people, too scared to call themselves African, too self-hating and jealous of one another to unite. Too fast to fall for the tricks of the white man and his systems. Too scared to call the white man white, too quick to kill a black man or woman, too fast to defend a white man, ignoring completely the crimes he has done and still does against humanity. The track titled The Final Solution, Slavery's Back in Effect, is especially chilling with its description of a government plan to reinstate slavery because blacks have failed to become contributing members of society, having squandered the numerous mm -hmm. opportunities and handouts given them. Who would have thought that it could happen here in the land of the free, home of the brave, the year is 95, you're a slave. In an interview following its release, Sister Soldier described the album as, quote, an amalgamation of all my thoughts, personal and professional experiences here in America, designed specifically for the African community. She has fierce, fiercely and fearlessly remained in her truth and continues to deliver it. Her medium, not her message, has changed. Sister Soldier's activism has literally taken a novel route. Instead of rapping, she's writing fiction. Acclaimed as the most compelling storyteller of the hip hop generation, Sister Soldier's novels are often classified as urban literature or street lit. She, however, eschews those genre labels, preferring to simply call her works literature. In her unique, in exercising her storytelling gift, Sister Soldier writes raw tales of a unique, with a unique elegance, unfolding themes of familial and romantic love, faith, spirituality, integrity. And there's drugs, guns, violence, and imprisonment. In short, humanity. 
What she has affected is a revolution in reading, particularly for young people of color. As she says, I've been successful in writing books that affect the people that I want to speak to most. I'm writing books that people who look just like me can read and enjoy, and most importantly, learn from. The truth is, we should all have a sister soldier moment. When people ask her what that phrase means, she replies, that's when you meet a beautiful, powerful woman and you just can't forget her. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow. Okay, feeling very empowered right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and fired up. Thank you so much, Ms. Dorothy Clark. That was, that, that was just incredible. Um, without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Dr. Karen Dade. Good morning. Good morning to the Black New England Conference audience. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be asked to be on this particular panel, especially since I know Dr. Robinson very well. I just want to give a shout out and congratulations to you, Shari, uh, for your new deanship, uh, along with your son, uh, Terry, TJ. Uh, who's been very instrumental in this conference. So just sending a lot of love out to you and to all of the organizers for this. Um, you know, it's a pleasure for me to be on this conference honoring Nina Simone as an incredible performing artist and activist that instilled so much pride and courage for Black people all over the planet, right? But before formally beginning my presentation, I would like to offer libations to the courageous and talented Black female artist. And I wonder if I can pull up my uh, PowerPoint right now with this, before I do that. So let me see. I'm going to go ahead and share. Is that right? And then let's see what happens from there. Uh, okay, not seeing the PowerPoint come up. Do you, do you have your PowerPoint open on your desktop? Uh, should be. Hold on, I hate to minimize. I hope, can I come back if I minimize? Absolutely. Okay, great. Technology, technology, right? Okay, so it is then. Okay, so if you, um, when you select share, it should give you a list of options that come up. Alrighty. Of all the windows that are on your computer and um, Microsoft PowerPoint should be one of those options. All right. Oh, I think I lost you. Oh. Okay, I'm trying to get back to you now. Should be uh, just a, a ring central window in the okay. bottom of your computer. Right. You click so, on that. Okay, so that's open, and I'm trying to share open system preferences. Is that what I'm doing? <clears throat> um, yeah. So, are, are you on a, a Mac? I am. Okay. And we and we tried this; it worked perfectly, and now it uh, doesn't want to. So my file is open. Okay. Um, just one you do, second. Yeah, because you also have that. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and just bring up your um, your presentation okay. for you. Otherwise, we'll have to run. All right. Thing, so. Right, right, and I don't want to take up all the time. But, but while we're waiting for that to come up, again, I just wanted to um, give libations, offer libations uh, to all of the courageous and talented Black female artists that have used their creative abilities to foster social change in this country and beyond. Black female artists such as 
uh, Alice Elizabeth Catlett, um, uh, Ruby D, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, Lena Horn, Billie Holiday, Josephine Baker, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, uh, Ngoze uh, Shange, Faith Ringgold, Audrey Lord, Catherine Dunham, Jessica uh, Moore, and so many others, including community and world community artists and scholars, um, such as Dr. Yvonne Daniel, who is still providing um, cultural arts education right here in Oakland, where I am in California. Um, and also I think about Ingrid Askew, who's now residing in um, South Africa and doing her work there, but she's also from uh, Massachusetts. So in this time of great uncertainty, it's so important that we rely not only on our well-known celebrity our artists that are um, activists, because art is activism, right? And, but we also rely upon our local uh, and our uh, scholars uh, who are also um, advocating and using the methods of social justice arts. And so today I really wanted to be able to uh, focus on uh, Nina, um, and I did it in such a way where I feel as though uh, Nina Simone actually echoes uh, what we as uh, Black women artists and scholars who are devoted to um, social uh, justice, um, the things that we go through and the lack of support often that we have. And I, I, I heard that uh, from Ms. Ralph uh, yesterday as well as others who have uh, spoken. And so I'd like to uh, go on and go to our, um, our second uh, slide. And as we're going to our second slide and we ask what happened to Ms. Simone, we also have to ask that um, as it relates to again, uh, all of the incredible black women artists uh, who have put their energies and all of their devotion and commitment into sharing with their communities, uplifting their communities through art and educating. So today I'm really focusing on art uh, as radical pedagogy. I had a video, I don't know whether or not if that video is available to uh, be shown as well. It's a pretty quick video, but it's going to give you a real demonstration of what we mean uh, by uh, critical art, uh, social justice, uh, pedagogy. And in the meantime, I wanted to mention, you know, I, I am from, I was born and raised in Roxbury, Massachusetts. And so um, my very uh, first experience as an elementary student I was real fortunate enough to see, uh, to go on the Black Freedom Trail in Boston. And I know that New Hampshire is really celebrating their Black Heritage uh, Trail. And in many cities, we have uh, these opportunities to be able to do that and to see those who came before us and, uh, the, and the sacrifices and things that they made. And going on, on this trail for Dr. Day, Dr. Day, we can't hear you. Yeah, we lost your audio. No. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. All righty. Okay, so um, I left off with Phyllis Wheatley. Did you hear that part? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. So I talked about being born and raised in Roxbury, Massachusetts. 
And um, having the opportunity as an elementary student to visit our Black Freedom Trail. And when I went on that Freedom Trail, I was able to visit Phyllis Wheatley's house. And I don't know how many of you know who Phyllis Wheatley is, um, but she was the first uh, Black published poet in the 1700s. Uh, she came from West Africa at the age of seven and um, she um, did this amazing uh, work in Boston, Massachusetts. And the reason why I bring her up is because she um, also wrote a poem that is very well uh, known and it's called From Africa to America. And the, um, that particular title unknowingly um, in 1986, I wrote a production and uh, developed a participatory workshop to teach those who are unaware um, of the forced migration of Africans and what happened when they came to this country. And so I developed that and I began to teach that as critical pedagogy in my uh, classes for students and, and beyond video clip that I wanted to be able to pull up. Um, I'm not quite sure if um, we can do that at this moment. Yeah, unfortunately, we weren't able to access that video. Um, so I, I, I'm going to keep trying to, to figure that out and we can um, either share it later or include it in the a link to it in the chat. Okay. Um, all right. So the, in essence, what that workshop does is it incorporates storytelling, dance, drama, music, and it allows us to be able to tell at least 400 years of our history, oftentimes within a two hour period, because we're using all of those different artistic modalities to be able to tell the story. So the point is that the arts are a very, very powerful method to be able to not only teach a social justice pedagogy, um, but also uh, to invigorate people. Um, and this is the work that, again, Nina Simone and others have been able to do. When she sang that song, To Be Young, Gifted in Black, um, I was at an age where it gave me such confidence um, and pride to, to be an African-American young woman. And I know that I stand on the shoulders of all of these incredible women. And so I guess let's just go on to, since I can't show that um, particular uh, video, can we just, we'll just go ahead and go on with the slides and I'll kind of go just to run right through them so that I won't be over time. Okay, so freedom. And in this now, each one of these um, slides, it actually has a um, things that she's saying, and I'm not seeing that opportunity to do that as well. Um, but she talks about when she was asked, you know, um, you know, to say, what is freedom? She said, freedom is having no fear. And I think all of us as Black women in whatever professions we are and what we face each and every day, we can be free and feel free when we have no fear. No fear because we stand on the shoulders of such strong women uh, that have led the way for us. And we can just go to the next slide. You're gonna notice that there are paintings um, beside each one of these uh, pictures that I have of Nina and her quotes. And these are paintings. So I'm not only a, a visual um, artist, I'm also a performing artist. So the first video piece would have shown you that those performing elements and doing the Africa to America. But each one of these particular uh, artworks that you see 
I felt uh, correlated very well to what Nina was talking about. So if you're looking at this particular piece right now, it's a mask, but there are over 20, this was the year of 2014, there were over 23 um, deaths of young black men um, through police brutality. And so it has all of their names in the head top of that. And so Nina is saying, I don't think you have a choice how you can be an artist and not reflect the times. And so I'm very committed to that uh, as an artist, as well as so many of my colleagues who are also in the field. And so we'll switch to the other, the next slide. Mississippi, goddamn, for her to be able to, in that time as a black woman, um, this was shocking that she would sing a song so powerful that would talk about uh, the times that were happening during the civil rights 60s movement. And with this courage that she had to sing this particular song, to write this particular song, it woke up America. It helped to wake up America. This is how powerful we are as Black women artists to be able to deliver those social messages. And you see in the corner there, that is another a work of mine on Central Park Five. And if you're looking at it from one side or another, it's gonna tell you some different things. It's a 3D um, piece of art. And it goes very much to this idea of Mississippi, God damn, right? Um, we'll go to the next slide. Everything had to be sacrificed for the music. As black women professionals, um, we're said to have super women capes on, that we get in up in the morning and we put those capes on and we sacrifice. We sacrifice in the sense that not only are we take, working with our families, we're working our jobs, but we're making sure that we are a part of a movement uh, for change in America. We can go to the next slide. It's too bad she, uh, you know, it's really her voice that would come up on this uh, particular piece. Uh, to be young, gifted, and black, and I'll, and I'll just go ahead and I'll end uh, with this. I'm sure that all of you uh, know this outstanding song. Um, it's a song that I often play in my classes uh, for my young students to hear, to give them the confidence to know. Um, how uh, unique and special and incredible they are as young people. And so this helped to lift up Black America, not only during my time in coming up, but continues to do so as I play it in my uh, classrooms. And so the picture that you see below would have been the uh, short video of, and you can see on the screen where it says, from Africa to America, where I talked about Phyllis Wheatley. And so it's wonderful to have, you know, I, I believe we had, I don't know, I think the count was 600 uh, students, both in audience and on stage, having this uh, experience that allowed them to have the empathy through going through the action of what happened uh, to be able to tell that story from Africa to America. So I'll leave it there. Again, um, art is a critical aspect to be able to make change in America, especially as it relates to um, African Americans and Black women artists are really holding that down. I will only say, please, wherever you are, um, try to reach out to your local community artists that are making all of these sacrifices, getting all of this wonderful material out there. Oftentimes, we're not supported financially to provide the best uh, to you. So I'll, I guess I'll end there at the moment. And sorry for all the technical difficulties, but that's what happens these days. Thank you so much, Dr. Dade. And thank you, all three of our, all three of our phenomenal um, 
informative, inspirational panelists. So we do have about 20 minutes to engage or facilitate a QA. and a And so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into that, if that's okay with all of you all. Um, so this question is, is for Kasha. So this is from Dorothy Clark, one of our panelists. <laughs> um, for me, Black Girl Magic was so inclusive. I am so dismayed to hear that first, your original phrase was truncated. And second, that stratification arose, arose amongst us Black girls with the phrase. It still means so much to me and makes me embrace all of us. Can you speak to that, Kanshaw? Yes, ma'am, I will speak to that. Um, I had no idea that um, there were people who felt left out until I got like a very heartfelt message from a young woman on Facebook. And I, I, I was just flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that there were women feeling left out and not only black women, but black women who were like me. I'm like, how, how did this happen? But it was, it's only a retrospect like through examining and seeing trends and stuff that I noticed that it it happened because again the verb was dropped it became a thing instead of who we are and when people try to own things you know I'm in sociology 101 right now so I'm learning about social conflict and how people want to fight over the thing that they see as valuable, you know, and they feel like certain people shouldn't have access to it because I must be, you know, more deserving because I've done this work and I've been this place and I have these type of things in my house or in my bank account when it, it has nothing at all to do with that. This is about inherent value. This is about inherent value. It's about, who we were born to be, who we were when we were born. Not even, it's not even about potential, it's about what is already there. At the moment of conception, at the moment as, that you exist as an egg cell inside of your mother, inside of your grandmother, you know, that that's what it's about. It's not about anything else. So it, it I, I figured out how it got away and why it turned into a thing where there were so many black girls, black women that felt left out. And I'm working really hard to rectify that. Like every time I get a chance to talk about it, I talk about it and I straighten folk out about it because I don't, I don't think I should know what I know and be capable of what I'm capable of with the pl platforms that I've been given that I should not speak about it. I should get everybody straight every time I get a chance because there are people who still have this misunderstanding of what Black Girls on Magic is about. So I, I thank you. I thank you for even having me here today. No, we thank you for sharing your your lived experience and your knowledge. So we we thank you. Um, I, I, as I'm looking when we went big screen, I'm checking out your shirt. So I don't know if the other participants can see. Maybe you can. Yeah, where we where can we get one of those shirts? Like we really want, we really want a shirt. I'm working on uh, reestablishing my online store. I have like this portfolio website that a friend built for me because she said I, she felt like I needed it. I'm like, okay. But Kashan.com is where the link will be to order these shirts. And I'm definitely going to have it up before the holidays. I've designed this one. I did, this was the original shirt I designed. I designed this because someone said, when I initially said hashtag black girls are magic, someone said, if you put that on a t-shirt, I'll buy it. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah. cool. And I, I hesitated it. I hesitated a little about, you know, a little while about, I said, okay, well, I'll make it. And maybe, you know, a few of my friends and some online supporters will buy it. I thought about 30 people will buy it and it would be fun for people to have. But um, 330 people bought it that first time. And wow. I made a lot of money and not a lot like exorbitant amounts, but a lot more than I thought I would get um, just selling t-shirts and sweatshirts with this particular logo that I designed on it. So mm -hmm. um, there's a whole nother story about the copyright that I'm not here to talk about today. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, well, 
I would say when you're ready to, you know, sell, resell the shirt, not resell, or sell the shirts or put the shirts in distribution, please reach out to the Black Heritage Trail. And I know, I, I, as I'm seeing reactions from the audience, and I'm definitely one of them, I, that, I, that would be a great Christmas birthday present to some of my phenomenal Black sisters that, that I know and have the honor and privilege of being in their lives. So I, I think, you know, and it's also, it's just affirming, right? Especially in this day and age that we live in. So please share that information. Let's move on to the next question. So this is for Ms. Dorothy. In this white dominated society, which has largely sought to minimize Sister Soldier and her efforts, what do you think her lasting legacy will be? Um, and this is from John Burns, and he says, thank you for your excellent presentation. <laughs> Thank you, John. Ooh, her lasting legacy. What's interesting is she never went away. What really happens is the media ignores you after a hot minute. So she has been there all along. She has traveled around the world, uh, created programs to educate and enrich youth. She's phenomenal. So the people who need to know who she is, they know. And then there's the others who will only know about the Wikipedia page and the so-called sister soldier moment. Her writing, she's got, oh gosh, what is it? I keep forgetting the number, what, seven books now? I wish I could do that. Uh, and she also wants to make her books into movies, so perhaps that will happen. There was um, an almost um, arrangement to make one of the books a movie, but I think that it, you know, if we just keep talking about her, pick up her books, she um, says her books are just books to read. Will they be American classics if we make them that? She says, hey, they're right up there with Shakespeare. She's writing about the same thing Shakespeare wrote about. Um, gang fighting, uh, the Capulets and, and, and um, the Montagues. Same stuff, romance, uh, difficulties within families. So she's, you know, um, cool. We just got to keep talking about her and re-listen re-listen re to the stuff. Um, someone did also ask, what was the statement that was taken out of context? And I purposely didn't mention it. <laughs> um, but since you asked, she had been interviewed by, and I got to call up my screen here, she had been interviewed by the Washington Post. This happened in 1992. It was after the police were acquitted in the Rodney King beating, and then there was a white man who was driving in a truck, and he was snatched out of his truck and beaten up. So Sister Soldier was basically trying to explain the, the mindset of a gang member. And oops, let's see where I put that. So she's talking with this reporter, explaining the mindset of a gang member. And she said, so if black people kill black people every day, why not have a week and kill white people? So if you're a gang member and you would normally be killing somebody, why not kill a white person? So if you strip that of its context, and she was qualified to speak about the thinking of gang members. So strip it of its context, it sounds like she's advocating that black people go out and start killing white people. No, it wasn't good at all. That's not what she meant, but Bill Clinton uh, picked up on it, which was a really nasty um, trick of his. And he did so in a, such a way that 
embarrassed Jesse Jackson because Sister Soldier had spoken at a Rainbow Coalition event and Bill Clinton was speaking the next night. And without even having said anything to Jesse Jackson prior to um, Clinton's speech, he just went off on how awful what Sister Soldier uh, said. And he even compared her to uh, the Ku Klux Klan's David Duke and said that if you exchanged uh, the words that Sister Soldier used, you know, substituting black for white and vice versa, then she would, you know, sound like a Klan member. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 We all understand and know and that has happened repeatedly throughout mm -hmm. history how you know something powerful that used to uplift and affirm us as people has been used out of context and used against us yes yes we, yeah we all just yes. shake our heads like been there done that uh-huh so thank you so much miss miss dorothy um mm -hmm. i have a question for dr dave um and i just have to say you know Dr. Dade and I go back a little ways. Uh, you know, she was everywhere I live. It is very important for my own self care and well being that I have a strong sister support group. And Dr. Dade was part of my sister support group when I lived in Washington and worked at Western Washington. And um, miss you dearly. Um, hate that we were not able to connect last week, but you know, uh, life is a little, little, little deep on campus right now. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't step out of my, my schedule to make that happen. Um, so we, we have some comments in the chat, but maybe can you expound or speak, speak a little bit more about oh, Sorry, of course, I would get a call in the middle of all this, right? Yeah. Um, and now I've lost my screen. See if I can get that back. Okay, there we go. Technology is great. You know, you know. and all these. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's media. Yep. So anyway, if you could speak a little bit or expound on the statement from Sister Simone, to be young, gifted, and black is where is that? And that's a fact. That was one of the, the comments from our participants. But if you want to expound on that a little bit, Dr. Day. You know, that was a time when, you know, all kinds of things were going on in this country regarding our civil rights as African Americans. And it's just an amazing thing that through song, uh, through plays, and through all kinds of visual arts, etc., and so on, that the, the message can go out um, to so many more. And so this idea of uplifting, to hear, to be young, gifted, and black, and you're sitting in a classroom where your teachers, you know, have no intention whatsoever to teach your history, to include you in the curriculum, but you're able to get that education from a song from a strong black woman that didn't mince her words about what was going on in the country. And so to have those kind of dedicated and courageous artists, that's where the education comes in for many of us, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why I still play that today for students because it's a part of education for them. Right. And no matter how much we get beat down, they get beat down for all of the things that we know about being pushed out of education, especially as black children, they can know mm -hmm. that we as a culture and we as strong black women support them wholeheartedly. And all they have to do is have that song in their heart and they can accomplish so much um, by just carrying those sentiments. Um, with them. So that's kind of why I think that that was a turning point for so many of us, especially, you know, at that young teenage age for me, uh, to say, you know, 
all these things that are going on to hold us back from having pride in the things that we're doing, we have these beautiful women out here that are making mm. those sacrifices to teach us through the arts who we are and how yes. to be proud of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's, pedagogy. That's teaching it. That's the critical yeah. pedagogy that we're talking yeah. about. When we talk about art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you, you said something that really resonated with me, Dr. Dave. I, I, I have the fortune of growing up in Chicago and, you know, up until about high school, I went to, I was in a predominantly black neighborhood. So my K through eighth grade was predominantly black schools with predominantly black teachers. And that is the message that they instilled that we were young, gifted and black. And there is not, and I know that I know that I know that it is not a coincidence that I have reached this level of education and this reached this level of professional success because I had those teachers every day, every year, you know, reaffirming that I am young, gifted, and black, and there's nothing that I can't do, right? That's yeah. just, I know that that's not a coincidence. So thank you so much, and that we need, that is what I think our youth is missing, you yeah. know, every day. It is that affirmation, right? That validation in the classroom. And so you were fortunate because for those of us, and again, I came up in Boston, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so I did not have, I had two black teachers. One was a second grade teacher and the other was the, an 11th grade teacher. And over and over again, I hear, you know, um, black women and men say that they never even had a black teacher. And so you, you were very fortunate, um, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Robinson, to be able to have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, for those who don't, rely on community, rely on, I mean, I, I became a civil rights activist at seven because my father was a civil rights activist. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to go on demonstrations and to protest and to do right. all of these things. And it right. made me very aware of what was right. needed, but that was yeah. not taught to me in school, not, not, Whatsoever. Right, yeah. right. That's right. So, so we we're down really to our last three minutes. And I want to, um, I don't really want to take the floor the last three minutes. I really want to have an opportunity to hear from Miss Dorothy and Miss Kushaw. If you could just really um, maybe take a minute and, you know, sh share closing remarks. Um, and then at that point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jerry Ann to give us instructions for the, the next panel for the conversational rooms in the next panel. So Ms. Dorothy, if you want to just take a minute and then Ms. Mm -hmm. Kashaw, take a minute. Okay, I am working my way through Sister Soldier's books. I recommend that you do as well. And you must start with her first one, which is called No Disrespect, which is a memoir, which is so, moving and her style of writing is just incredible as i said it's raw but it is so elegant and she just tells her truth about growing up in the bronx uh, kind of impoverished and and she's just a, an example of what our young black people can be just observe, looking at things around them, even when things are really weird or, you know, the adults in your life are not uh, taking care of things the way they should. But the children will, will come up. Thank you. Okay. And Kasha, you, you're probably going to give us our last words and then we're going to turn it back over to the, the, the conference to give us instructions. Okay, I just wanted to say, I want to hit a few points with this last statement. I am a Black teacher. I teach Head Start. Um, I went to Head Start. I come from a Black teacher. My mother taught in D.C. public schools for over 20 years. And some questions I got was, how do we um, have each other, other Black women, to see each, the value in each other? And one thing I do all the time is I tell Black women and Black girls, you deserve everything you want. The world will tell you you don't. will tell us we don't deserve that, but we do. I mean. It's an extreme, I think it's an extreme thing to say because you tell kids, you know, you can't have everything you want. Okay, you can't, but you deserve it. 
you know, and I tell black girls all the time, you deserve everything you want. If you want to have that party, if you want to have that relationship, if you want to have that job, go for it because you deserve it. And I think that boosts, again, what we see as our own wealth, our own worth. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> that's just super important to me. So that's what I do all the time. I never deny a black girl, a black woman, anything that they want, you know, because we have been told so many times that we just, just meet your needs and you'll be okay. Just meet your needs and you'll be okay. And what I call it is the pleasure principle. We have to live to our own pleasure principles. Whatever things that bring us joy, snatch joy, hashtag snatch joy. That's what I say all the time. So don't like, I have a very spoiled daughter because of that, but she has also grown up to be able to provide those things for herself. Okay. Thank you so much, Kasha. And I, there was, and Dr. Day, I'm not asking you a question, but um, I think Crispin has added the link to your um, video. There was a question about how can we learn more about your multidisciplinary interactive storytelling project, and Crispin has added a video link so we can, um, you should save this chat because it's full of a lot of good nuggets. Um, and at this point, I just want to thank you so much um, for giving me the, the honor and the privilege to moderate this, this uh, panel that has really resonated and spoke to my heart and spirit today. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry and thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sherry, and thank you so much to the panelists. We're going to break out into these little conversation rooms. Everybody will be put in a conversation room if you wanna be there. If you're one of the panelists and you wanna participate, please do so. And you can serve as the facilitator because I'm not sure just if we have a facilitator in every room. And the purpose of the conversations room is just to talk about what we learned from this panel. So just an open-ended question will start the dialogue or for example, if you heard something that surprised you, that interests you or that you did not know. So if you just do that, then the conversation will start in your conversation rooms. The conversations room will close at 1025. We will hear from one of our New Hampshire activists, Samantha Sears, for a minute. And then the next panel will start at 1030, which is fired up and ready to go, Black women and electoral politics, which will feature Andrea Jenkins, Senator Spearman, and Kaya Morris. So we'll see you um, back at 1030 for the next panel.